Great, Shay, if you wanna go ahead and put the slides up. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here at the end of May for our TA webinar. Uh, my name is Julia Schluter and I am a CQII coach. Um, I have the privilege today of uh, presenting with Julie Saber and Jocelyn Thompson from the great state of Texas. They are here to share with us uh, real world examples of sustainability um, in different Ryan White programs. And so that is really exciting to me because not only you get to hear sort of the theoretical, but you get to see how it is put into play uh, in the real world with Julie and Jocelyn. So that's great. Next slide, please. Today, we're here to talk about sustainability. We'll talk about the different types of sustainability. Uh, the elements are things that you should consider sustaining and different factors that affect the sustainability. Uh, our didactic piece of the um, TA webinar today is um, from Dr. Scott Thomas, who has a really wonderful toolkit about sustainability. Um, the link is at the very end of this presentation and it has so many tools in there and uh, you know, check sheets to fill out, things like that. So I'd really recommend at the end of the webinar checking out that resource. Um, Shay, can you go ahead and put up the poll? So before we, um, we go any further, it would be great to figure out who we have on the call and your experience with sustainability. So go ahead and fill that out for us. And then Shay, when you think we have kind of the most of the folks answering, can you uh, show us the results? We'll do. We're about 86%. Oh, come on. Let's see if we can get to 90 people. Let's get to 90%. I know we can do it. It's Thursday afternoon. Oh, wait, no, I just realized that means the four is us. Oh, so. ah, oh, so we're there. <laughs> ah, like, wait, that's it. <laughs> ah, we did it. Hooray. We beat my 90. That's great. Okay. So if we look at this, uh, you know, we can see that we have some a variety of experiences here with sustainability. Um, the majority of the folks look like they're kind of, they're a beginner. They know about the concept of sustainability, but haven't yet really um, applied it within their their own organizations. Uh, we have some intermediate, and for those folks who are advanced, we have four of you on this call. Please chime in, put your experiences into the chat room. Um, we are you know, a community of learners together, and so we're really here um, to, to learn from each other. So we're excited you're here. Let me toss the slides back up, Shay. Next slide, please. Perfect, and go one more for me. Awesome, okay, so um, to get us sort of grounded in thinking about and talking about sustainability, there are three types of sustainability. Uh, we, the first type is organizational. So thinking about actually sustaining the existence of an operations of an organization. Then we have program sustainability. This is the ongoing activities or services of a program as it relates to, um, to quality improvement, you can think of this as like the processes or procedures of a quality improvement project that you're implementing. That's what we think about program sustainability. And then there's outcome sustainability. This is really focused on sustaining the gains that your quality improvement project was focused on. What were those health outcomes? Maybe it was viral suppression, uh, retention, or maybe even, um, you know, if we look at our collaborative that we're currently doing, maybe it's about substance use um, and decreasing substance use disorder. So we want, those are the three types of sustainability. Our uh, webinar today will really focus on program sustainability and outcome sustainability. And we'll talk about some, some influences and some factors to consider when you're thinking about um, those two types of sustainability. Next slide. So this definition of sustainability, um, outcome sustainability is from the National Health Services. And um, there are some sort of key phrasing within this definition that is very, I think, important to point out. 
Uh, the first one talks about new ways of working. So in your PDSA cycles, when you are implementing and piloting a change in system or a change in process, this new way of working um, is, is what's highlighted here. We also see the words improved outcomes. So this calls to the fact that we have to measure things, right? Like we have to have some type of measurement to know what our baseline was and if what we implement was improved and how we sustain that improvement. So you have to keep measuring. You know, the uh, HRSA's policy clarification notice 1502, like your bedtime friend, right? Like you read it at night because it's so great. Um, HRSA's policy clarification notice 1502 tells us that we have to monitor our performance measures quarterly. And so, but that's also part of sustainability. We monitor and continue to measure to know that those outcomes that we achieve through the PDSA cycles and our, our system improvements are sustained over time. And then the last little piece of this has become the norm. So making sure that the new way of working, the things that you tested and tried through your PDSA cycles, they become the, the business as usual. So we've tried it, we've figured out it, it works and this is good. So now we want to normalize it and have it become business as usual. Next slide, please. So the framework that we're going to use and talk about today was developed by Dr. Scott Thomas. And it thinks about um, improving outcomes and programs. So again, not that organizational sustainability. We're not talking about how to sustain a, an organization's existence, but rather the processes and procedures um, that's about program sustainability and then the outcomes um, for outcome sustainability that are related, related to improvement of health outcomes over time. Um, so it's important that um, we look at these factors, but also that funding the continuation of this sustaining our um, new and improved processes, funding isn't the only piece of this. And there are um, several other factors that Dr. Thomas and his colleagues would like, and like us to consider as we're making a sustainability plan. Next slide. So uh, Dr. Thomas's framework has, um, it's, it's like a, a buffet of factors, if you will. And um, there are 12 altogether. But uh, what Dr. Thomas and his colleagues found was that if you focus on selecting three to four of these particular sustainability factors, it will really strengthen and enhance the sustainability of your program and of your outcomes. Um, the factors were developed by um, a number of sources. They did some uh, research into some a qualitative study, and they also looked at um, fat. Re, they looked into research that um, talked about the sustaining and spread of quality improvement in healthcare, and so kind of within the sort of meta analysis that Dr. Thomas and his colleagues did, they they identified these 12 factors as being the key factors in sustainability for program and outcome sustainability. And um, it's important to also know that uh, fact, the factors that they talk about, and we'll go over in just a little bit here, are used to strengthen one another. And the toolkit is really helpful because the toolkit has this cool table that shows if you wanna focus on this particular factor, it will also help to strengthen these other two or three factors. So again, highlighting the importance of spending some time with that toolkit is really important. Um, Dr. Thomas and his colleagues also um, you know, state that in the toolkit that factors can um, have subsets as well. So perceived value is one of the factors that we'll talk about. And in perceived value, you can think of that as it relates to clients, as it relates to providers, or even the community. So that's why we meet what I mean by um, different subsets. Next slide, please. All right, so, so what are we sustaining? Um, I think it's sometimes difficult, especially when we're, we're maybe have newer experiences with sustainability or newer to quality improvement. And you're at the beginning of this and you're thinking, okay, this is great, but what, what, what am I supposed to sustain? How, how do I even know where to begin with that? And so, you know, we really want you to think about the people 
the policy, the procedure, and the processes that need to be sustained to keep things running smoothly. And um, that will keep your improved outcomes that you tested and saw over time in your QI projects, that you sustain those outcomes. Um, it does get clearer as uh, you start to apply the factors and use, use the tool um, and helps you really focus in on, on the things that need to be sustained. Next slide, please. So in our past learning collaboratives, um, the overall consensus and the research that was done about the learning collaboratives, there were sort of five major influences of sustainability. Uh, the first one is relationships. So trusting that and respecting that the person and the staff who need to do this new and improved process, that thing that has become uh, business as usual, that they'll do, we'll do that, we'll get it done, that the relationships are there. A second major influence is senior management. So you need that leadership there. You need the leader in the room when you're hearing updates on the, on the sustained process to reinforce certain ideas, to be the leader for the people who are carrying out those processes that you want to be sustained. Maybe they're putting that into, um, into job descriptions. So you really need that senior management support. Another uh, factor in, or influencer in sustainability that we found through our learning collaboratives is input and communication. So how are you, uh, how are you communicating what it is that you've sustained? What do you have a plan for uh, ensuring that the, the people you want to carry out this process can, can do it. They feel equipped and trained and ready. Um, and if there's turnover, that you have a plan for communicating and training those next line of people. That's this next influence is preparing for turnover. And then the last one is talking about broadcasting successes. I think um, frequently when we talk to different sites, they, people and their quality teams do a great job of sharing their successes internally maybe just with their QI team, but we have to broadcast successes. And that means thinking even externally outside of your agency, talking to your community partners, talking to other organizations within your region or your state saying, we did this, it worked really well. So that was another um, major element or influence in terms of sustainability through our past learning collaboratives and what sites have, have uh, told us about sustainability. Next slide, please. So Dr. Thomas and his colleagues say, when you're thinking about which factors to select for um, your sustainability plan, they want you to really consider two questions. The first is, how important is this particular factor to your improvement project? Um, you know, so you could think about something like, maybe organizational infrastructure doesn't really apply because you're not, you don't need to enhance or worry about organizational improvements because you don't have a partner with somebody. Um, so you have to really think about how important is the factor. And then you need to ask yourself, essentially, what do we have influence over? Um, you might think that government policies are an important factor to your sustainability but you might have very little control or influence over this particular factor. So maybe that's one you don't select to plan for in terms of your sustainability planning. Or you might believe that leadership support within your organization is very important to help sustain a process, but realize that you maybe have very limited access to leadership and therefore you have you know, limited influence over them. So maybe you wouldn't pick that factor. So you, as you, are, you and your team are going through this sustainability planning process, you want to consider these two questions as you're looking at each factor. So now we're gonna actually get into the factors. Shay, can you go to the next slide? So the first factor is perceived value. So acknowledging the value by individuals or groups affected by the new ways or the new improved outcomes. Um, this could mean, as an example, giving regular feedback on those improved outcomes to key stakeholders. You could present data at meetings. You could present them to your consumer advisory board. You could, you could also present it um, to leadership meetings. 
The second uh, factor for consideration is monitoring and feedback. So monitoring um, that's conducted on a regular basis. So again, going back to what we already know we should be doing per our, uh, our, our buddy, the policy clarification notice 1502, we're monitoring our performance measures quarterly. We're also continuing to do that for um, measurement that it relates to sustained activities. And then we're giving that feedback in easy to understand formats. One example of this could be that you, you host a quarterly information gathering call to monitor the project outcomes. How is that going? The talk to the staff, you know, what's going on? We've asked you to, you know, make this new process business as usual, but tell us how, what that really looks like and feels like for you. Um, you could also use charts or graphs um, to talk about the improved outcomes and post those in different locations on like a waiting room monitor or share it in a meeting with um, different target audiences. The third factor is leadership. So this is, is the degree to which leaders, decision makers, champions, um, however you want to define that leadership element, they continue to be actively engaged. So you could have leaders present the updates. So maybe the data coordinator puts together the monitoring and feedback, but the leader actually is the one to present it and share about the outcomes um, at regular management meetings. You could invite the leaders to participate in your planning meetings or the um, do a gimbal walk. I know at, uh, with Julie and Jocelyn, the, at Fax Clinic, you guys do gimbal walks all the time. That's a great way to involve your leadership, get them out of like the executive level and bring them down, have them walk through and see. So that's another great way to involve your leadership. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, we're moving into the, the next set of sustainability factors. And the first one on the top of the list here is staff. So ensuring that staff have the skills, the confidence, and the interest in continuing the new ways of working and uh, making that new way of working in their mindset business as usual. This means uh, having training plans, having procedures and protocols in place so that uh, when there is staff turnover, that um, a training system is ready and um, ready to be deployed for that new staff. Uh, Shared models. So this talks about, you know, the continued use of a shared model. In the we talk about in C, at CQII and also HRSA that you have to have um, a selected methodology or approach for your quality improvement projects. And so that's what this factor is really talking about. So we use um, the model for improvement and plus PDSA cycles. And so that's what this means. That means that we are deciding on a distinct methodology that we're sharing those models. Um, and that is one factor that's related to sustainability is that selected approach or driven, driven methodology. Uh, the last factor on the slide is organizational infrastructure. So what's the degree to which internal resources, job descriptions, your systems, your business model, support that new way of working. Um, in the current learning collaborative, there are a few sites in the substance use group that are adding um, elements of their intervention into their job descriptions. So trauma-informed care, harm reduction. So that's, that's one way to sustain their interventions is by adding it to their job descriptions. Or you could allocate resources, putting um, you know, pieces of funding towards that new way of working to really support the infrastructure that's necessary to sustain that process improvement. Next slide, please. The, um, the last three, uh, oh, nope, we're on our third slide. There are 12 yeah. factors. So we're, <laughs> so the, the next factors, uh, the first one at the top here is organizational fit. And so, this talks about you know, the degree to which the new way of working uh, matches your, your overall goal, your values, your mission, your operations of your organization. And so one example of this would be you know, to incorporate the new processes that you've designed into the organization's overall strategic plan. Uh, making it fit there will also increase sustainability of the, of the process that you want to become business as usual that you've tested and tried. 
Uh, community fit talks about the degree to which the new ways of working match communities' interests. And uh, an example of this might be um, to provide like STI screening or HIV testing at locations that are accessible to community members and available at convenient times. So not just like the middle of the day on a Wednesday, because the because that works for the staff, thinking about community fit and sustaining processes. The last uh, sustainability factor on the slide is partnership. And that's the involvement of partners who actively participate in new ways. So if in your quality improvement project, you had a referral to an outside partner agency, or maybe that outside partner agency supplied like a mental health staff member to come and be on site at your clinic. You want to ensure that those uh, partnerships and agreements, maybe business associates agreements, um, are in place so that they can continue your partnership and sustain the process um, that you tested and tried through your quality improvement project. Next slide. All right, we're almost there, I promise. So the last three factors in our sustainability toolkit talk about spread. So thinking about the expansion to additional locations or populations. I think this is an important one. If, if you are a network person on this, on this call, um, maybe a part A, part B, or even a C and D that have network sites. If you um, tried a particular QI project at one site or one location and it worked really well, and you're like, oh, this is so cool. We've got to see if it would work at our other sites. Then you need protocols and processes that you can then spread to other network sites to, to see the same improved outcomes that you saw at the particular agency you tested it at. Uh, the next sustainability factor is about funding. So obtaining funding beyond the original grant period. Again, we, you know, we said at the beginning, funding isn't the only thing that you need to sustain, but also if, if you do need it to sustain your processes, then that's what you have to go after. Uh, the last sustainability factor is government policies. So um, this again is the degree to which the new ways of working are supported by government policy. This one's kind of hard because a locus of control is pretty limited, but um, I think a good sort of example in the healthcare field, although outside of HIV is um, securing reimbursement through CMS if you do particular screenings um, or you know, smoking cessation screenings for specific populations. So that might be an example of that. All right, last, last slide, please, before I hand it over. So just again, in thinking about sustainability and making a plan is we wanna to stress to you all, make a plan because you can't just like pat yourselves on the back, say, yeah, we achieved our goal and walk away. You have to create that plan for sustainability. And it's really important that you do that with your team, that you ensure that the people who are going to be part of that sustained process, the business as usual now, are part of your sustainability planning and that you have the staff dedicated for those activities. You wanna use a sustainability framework. We've talked about one today. There are definitely others out there. We just want you to use one and then use a planning tool to help guide your processes. So that is it for the didactic portion of our webinar today. Now I have the pleasure of turning it over to Julie Saber and uh, to Jocelyn Thompson. Next slide, please. They are from Texas and I'm really pumped because they have two um, examples. One is at the systems level and then one is at the agency and clinic level. So where are my part A's and my part B's? We've got you covered and we've got our C's and D's covered. So take it away, Jocelyn and Julie, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Julie Saber, and I'm the quality coordinator for the Texas Department of State Health Services. And like Julia shared on the previous slide, we're going to share two real world examples. Um, so working at the state health department, we're the systems level of care, right? So we don't have a lot of influence on exactly what goes on in the clinics or the other uh, support service agencies, but we can uh, continually provide infrastructure and work on capacity building and make sure everyone's following the most current guidelines for HIV services and care and those types of things. So I used to work at the Bex Clinic before Jocelyn did. Uh, I started there in 2013 and worked there till 2018 when I moved over to the state. And when I started in 2014, um, 
I was really excited and learned a lot from uh, back then it was called the National Quality Center, which is now the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. But when I came to the health department, my first task was uh, being invited to lead the state on the End Disparities Collaborative, which was sponsored by HRSA and supported by the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation with coaching and affinity sessions and all kinds of stuff. We were all working on viral suppression and in the state of Texas, as you all know, it's huge, right? So it's like a going to a different state when you go to different counties. There's lots of rural areas and there's four to five really big metro areas. Um, and so everything's a little bit different and the populations are different. So getting everyone on the same page was a big, huge task, but this End Disparities Collaborative really helped me um, to get my feet wet on that and get to know everyone across the state that's working in the Ryan White program with us, who we are uh, the funder for. Um, and so our experience just at a high level, um, we had a goal um, to reach viral suppression across the state for our Ryan White B population. However, we were working cross part with everybody in Texas that's working to help people living with HIV have improved lives and outcomes and access to care and all those great things that lead to viral suppression. Um, so it was an 18 month collaborative. Some of the pictures you see here are from folks all across the state. Uh, this is Miguel from the Valley area, the border region. Um, this is Oscar from the Dallas region. Dr. Salinas, he re leads the Dallas County uh, quality uh, management team. And this is kind of a few of us from all over, uh, Fort Worth, Houston, Dallas, the Valley. Anyway, we all uh, celebrated at the end of the collaborative by going to the HRSA offices uh, for learning session four. Um, anyway, back to what we're here for sustaining, right? So that was a long collaborative. I came in right the kind of after it was started and then they asked me to help. So. Um, I was, we really focused a lot on communication of the cross part um, funded uh, administrative agencies and clinics across the state. So we can all get to know each other. We're all, we all had the same goal and very similar visions, but we were kind of working in silos. So this collaborative really helped to open those doors. We all looked at our data. We selected priority populations based on the region. So at the state, I just kind of facilitated and coordinated and helped each other help the different regions uh, work together. Um, but I still had my big overall goal, right? So when we look at the state um, data together, when, we, when I started out the collaborative, it was around July, 2018, we were at 77% viral suppression. Our goal was to get to 80. So that doesn't sound like very much, right? 3%, but at the state, in the state of Texas, just the Ryan White Part B alone, not even counting C, D, and A's, we serve over 35,000 people every year of unduplicated clients, and we offer over 27 services. So it's a lot of people, right? It's not just 3%, it's a lot of people um, that we uh, help to have better outcomes. However, to be perfectly honest, we did not achieve our goal by the end of the collaborative, but we were really excited because we were making some gains, 1%, 2%. Again, though, that's a lot of people. Um, I didn't break it out into the amount of people, which I should have, but sorry, uh, but it's a lot. <laughs> anyway, so we kept working and working, and we also simultaneously were working on ending the HIV epidemic and launching this great... Um, it's a movement called Achieving Together to End the HIV Epidemic in Texas. And so at our conference, I think it was in 2017, um, we launched the um, website and had a big party. And anyway, we had people from all over different communities helping us to build this plan. So the plan to end the epidemic in Texas was built by community members, not people at the state. We all helped, but um, it was really from the community saying what they think uh, will help people or help to end the epidemic. So we did great um, with getting a lot of stakeholder feedback. So when this collaborative ended, we still wanted to keep going. And we this collaborative had, um, I think, four affinity groups that was like MSM, MSM of color, 
women and youth and transgender. So what we did is we already had affinity sessions going on for our ending the HIV epidemic. So we moved our folks over that were participating and invited them to join these other affinity sessions. And it went really smoothly and we continued on. And by December, 2019, we surpassed our goal of 80 and made it all the way to 83%. And individually in the um, regions, folks were different on working on different populations. So our transgender viral suppression rate, rate went up, our youth uh, viral suppression rate went up, but at the state systems of care, right? It's the bottom line. Um, so all of the numbers went up, right? A little bit. So we made uh, that goal and surpassed it. So super excited. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, that's just kind of high level, a lot went into it. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Shime, can you uh, advance the slide? Thank you. So these are just really high level um, overview of some of the activities that we use to maintain those gains. We continued working on our infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. At the health department, like I mentioned at the beginning, that's really our place, right? To make sure you have a data system, to make sure you have information, to make sure training is happening across the state, um, addressing the needs of the different areas. Um, then we aligned our goals with the ending the HIV epidemic, which are very similar, right? 90, 90, 90 were our goals, 90% um, virally suppressed, 90% of our folks are retained, 90% um, well, anyway, I'm losing my train of thought and 50% less new uh, acquisition of HIV. So we continued working, continued working, continued trainings. We implemented monthly trainings. We call them fundamentals and we have different topics every month. They're always on the fourth Tuesday of the month from 1.30 to 2.30. So it's the same time every month. So folks can join as they can, as their schedules permit. It's been very successful. We have over a hundred, well, 52, over a hundred folks join us every month. We have speakers from around the, from experts around the uh, state and outside of the state. And some of them are just us at the health department. Uh, but we invite our providers who are champions to share their knowledge with others. And um, then we build these activities into workflows. And so did our subrecipients. So um, next slide, please. We really tried to make it a culture of quality. Everything we do will link back to our quality plan. So um, next slide, please. So these are some of the um, things that we worked on. Uh, the leadership training series, we had eight sessions of those where we had an expert consultant work with us to present those virtually. We uh, set up an online web page with all kinds of quality improvement resources. I can share that link with you if you're interested. We always are uh, aligning everything we do with the achieving together to end the epidemic. We have another database for our monitoring that we do across the state where we can use that data for benchmarking so people can see how other regions are doing because we all have access to that database as leaders of quality. And we can kind of um, see you know, who's doing well. Maybe we should connect with them and see how they're you know, managing to achieve such great outcomes. Uh, we also use dashboards, 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 right? Electronic dashboards, physical dashboards. Before the pandemic, we were all at the central office in Austin for the health department, and we had a big giant glass display case where I would update graphs and charts and information like every couple of weeks. And that brought interest from other programs like the TV people and the hepatitis B. What is this about? Tell me more about it. So it really helped get the word out and spread, just like Julia was talking about earlier, sharing your successes, right? We also implemented uh, recognition awards to our different regions of who was really doing great work. And we did it in person and gave them a certificate and clapped and celebrated and loved it. Um, we also then just shifted our work from end disparities into the Create Equity Collaborative, where it's kind of the same thing, but just, just focusing on a maybe specific different population than the previous collaborative. So our, um, when we looked at our data, we realized that our population between 25 and 39 was 3% behind the viral suppression rate of everyone else, right? A little bit slower for them to reach viral suppression. So that was our choice to um, focus on for the next 
for this uh, collaborative going on that kind of just winded down uh, this month. But we will be continuing to work on it and sustain that as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, all of our QI projects and work and activities always are linked to one of the four strategic domains or all of them sometimes. Some of the projects hit all of those. Um, always working on access to care. Always want to make sure the experience of the client and the patient is good. They're, the only way they're going to come back is if they have a good experience. And that's so important. They deserve respect and and um, you know anything we can do, pay attention to your surveys, listen to your customers. And then of course, the whole work is about improving health outcomes for, for all of us in our communities, right? Um, and with HIV, it affects everybody, right? So um, it's very important. And then eliminating disparities. Everybody should have the same opportunities to, and to access healthcare and education and all that. Um, so those are our four domains. So everything we do in Texas is has to be linked to one of those to um, be approved for a quality improvement project or activity, so on and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So these are these are our data from this current project. We started um, reporting our data in March of 2021. Here's our 3% below rate. Like I was talking about, these are our 25 to 39 year olds. And these are our overall population. So you can see, Unfortunately, we did make gains um, by one year later, we had improved greatly, but we didn't close the gap. So we're still going to work on this. I currently have a survey going. Uh, it's been out for about a month. We offer $20 gift cards. We started just focusing on this age group, but we weren't getting a lot of responses. So we opened it up to all ages because we think everyone has some good insight to share with us and we can collect the demographic data and decide which age groups you know, are reporting different issues. Um, next slide, please. And so now we'll shift over to maintaining gains at the clinic level. So this is me in like 2014 with our nursing staff. And you can see we have, this is our uh, little hallway um, where all the staff have to go through the providers, all the nurses, um, but we would have a gimbal walk every week with the leadership of a big, huge health system. I think it employs over 7,000 people and the um, executive staff would take turns, about four of them, and they would go to all the clinics in the building and look at their boards and offer assistance to help them with their projects or ask them, why are you working on this? Things like that. Um, give us recognition, support, or tell us, hmm, that doesn't make sense, tell me more. Things like that. It was super helpful and it, I believe it's still going on. I'm gonna let Jocelyn share in a minute, but this is our board over here. And on this side, we did staff recognition. So we would acknowledge people um, for good work or someone's graduating or somebody got married, just things like that to keep the trust and you know uh, relationship building alive. Um, so I am now, so I just want everyone to know the FACTS clinic is an acronym like all the things we do in HIV, right? It's really uh, stands for the Family Focused AIDS Clinical Treatment Services. But nobody wants everyone in the world to know they're going to um, the clinic for, you know, that particular, you know, it's private. So the acronym helps in a big, large health system um, so people can maintain their privacy. Anyway, I have uh, collaborated or met to, met up with Jocelyn recently and asked her, is this still going on? You know, tell me more about how things are now. So uh, next slide, please. Um, well, first, let me finish this part. So back when I started, our vaccine rates were super duper low. I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do, right? Because our population was primarily adults. And our children, we would send to the pediatricians for their vaccines and just share the records. But our adults were missing out here. So we uh, knew we needed to do something. The population size when I worked at FACS was somewhere, you know, it varied year over year, but always somewhere between about 2,400 to 3,000 clients, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Um, and sometimes that just depended on the time of the reporting of data. Um, but again, our rates were very low. We needed to do some serious QI work. So here's what we did. Next slide, please. We implemented standing vaccine orders and pre-visit chart reviews. If you're not familiar with those. So we have standards of care in Texas, and I'm sure everyone does in their state, where we expect certain things, right? From based on the HIV clinical guidelines, for example, having a viral load test 
twice a year or more, depending on the client situation, having vaccines up to date based on uh, the CDC schedule, um, offering screenings and uh, referrals, things like that. So we created a little Excel sheet with what we thought were the top maybe 10 or 12 indicators that we get monitored for and that we know are important for uh, improving health outcomes. And before the client came, the day before we knew, we had our little list of who's scheduled for appointments the following day, and we would go through the chart and see who needs what. Does this person, do they have the, do they have up-to-date vaccines? And if not, which ones? Let's plan for it, let's write it down. And then we would give it to the provider. So when the, doc, when the patient came, they would know what to order. Well, that kind of worked and kind of didn't work because sometimes they wouldn't pay attention to our sheet. So then we implemented nursing standing vaccine orders where we could do it ourselves. We just had to write the protocol and have the medical director agree and sign it and make sure it made sense and that it was the most current information. And once we started doing that, oh my gosh, nurses are much better at uh, keeping up with vaccines than doctors. They have a lot on their mind and that's not always their priority. But to nurses, we love, uh, we're very task oriented. So you tell us what somebody needs and we're gonna make sure they get it or at least offer it to them and um, give them the information they need to make an informed decision. Uh, we also join in Texas, we have a wonderful program where we get free vaccines for people that are underinsured or um, have low income and no insurance. They don't offer every single vaccine, but they offer several and it saves us so much money. Oh my gosh, it was unbelievable. Um, Cause we couldn't afford to stock some of the vaccines because they weren't indicated for every person and they're very expensive. So we would give prescriptions for the client to go to the pharmacy and get it. And we would never find out if they actually, you know, completed that or not. So anyway, moving right along. Um, so things started moving. We also do other things on those nurse visits, um, other kinds of injections like hormone replacement if the client's been on it and the doctor agrees and thinks it's you know uh, ongoing treatment. We also um, would have clients come in person to pick up their narcotic prescriptions if they have chronic pain issues, things like that. Um, we always kept up our kept up with updating our performance board. And then we would be all nervous all day for the gimbal walk. What are they going to say today? Are they going to like our work or whatever? But once we got used to it, we would start looking forward to it. And then we even would have staff huddles to prepare for the gimbal walk. <laughs> so anyhow, um, next slide, please. Look at the great improvement we achieved. So back in the day, <laughs> we were doing vaccines sometimes. Some of them we weren't doing at all. Like I said, we didn't stock them. We sent them out. We didn't know if they got completed or not. But now I'm gonna move um, or pass it on to Jocelyn to share, are these things still going on? I know they are based on the numbers, but can you tell us how you have taken that um, work uh, flow that we established so I left, I'd never met Jocelyn until about a year ago at an association of nurses meeting. Um, but anyway, I knew she was the new quality coordinator and I know they got a new data system. So they've done some improvement, but followed kind of the, the base of this project and has sustained it over eight years now. So take it over, Jocelyn. <laughs> okay, no, no worries. Um, and so we still implement, of course, the um, standing, de uh, standing delegated orders um, at the Fox Clinic. Um, what the nurses are doing on a daily basis is, of course, um, we are uh, doing like chart checks, um, chart reviews before the patient will come into the clinic and just kind of going over um, like their chart, looking at the immunization history to see um, what vaccines they have, what um, vaccines they are needing to um, catch up on, um, like as far as with the pneumonia vaccine, um, you know, you would get that first dose of the um, pneumo 23, and then five years later, um, you would get that second dose. And so um, we're just making sure that they are um, getting that, um, that vaccine on a scheduled time when they're supposed to receive it. So the nurses, they do really good at doing the chart reviews before the patient comes in. Um, of course, uh, you know, we will look at their lab just to make sure that they are within the CD4 level to get those vaccines because sometimes they're not well enough to even get them. And sometimes the 
the director, she is like, no, give it to them. They need it. Let's go ahead and just do all the vaccines while they're here. Um, so it's just, you know, depending, but um, we are like really on top of um, like I, our shingles vaccine, um, I, I, we're giving them out like candy. Um, since, of course, the CDC did recommend the uh, change for our patients that are 19 and up that are immunocompromised, they do uh, recommend them to have that vaccine um, starting at the age of 19. So since our ASM program only carries a certain um, amount of the vaccine for us, um, unfortunately, the Shingrix vaccine is not um, one of the vaccines that they're covering. Um, that was as of last year when we um, no longer got the Shingrix from ASN. So our uh, director, of course, um, factored it into the grant for our unfunded patients. And um, they are getting those vaccines at no charge to them. So we are including them and in stocking up on as much private Shingrix as we can just to make sure that they are receiving those vaccines because of with them being immunocompromised, it's very important for them to receive that vaccine. Um, so, as you want to talk that, about how you have also um, used Epic to help with those health maintenance reminders? Oh, absolutely. So, with our new system, Epic, which I swear we learn something every day, <laughs> Epic has a tool into the um, the uh, chart where it's like a blue sticky note. So that blue sticky note will actually pop up for the provider. Um, so once we're looking, we're doing our chart reviews or whatever the nurse is, um, we'll go ahead and say um, patient due for this vaccine. Um, last office visit was this time, last lapse was this. So they'll uh, provide that information for the provider and they can see that it'll pop up for them to see. And so, but we're giving them before the provider even comes into the, into the room. They're already vaccinated by the time they get into the room. So they are, we're like really on top of it, so. That's also a great way to uh, fill the time while the client is waiting for the provider. We know providers, you know, one person is five minutes late and then that kind of throws the snowballs the whole day, right? So things yeah, get behind, absolutely. sometimes clients are waiting. Go ahead, Jocelyn, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, that, uh, I was just going to um, agree with you on that one because we've actually seen quite a bit of improvement in our wait times when I did my clinical quality management plan um, for the year. Um, we had first quarter, we were really, I think we were about like 90 minutes. I have it pulled up here. So we were like, as far as with patient wait time, we were at 90 minutes. <laughs> Um, so we were just trying to figure out how can we get those 90 minutes down to a lesser time um, for, you know, uh, the patients to not wait um, so long. So um, by quarter four, we were at, we wanted a goal of actually 76 and we were at 77 minutes. So, oh, um, so close. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were like right there, but um I, it ha I think it had a lot to do with, of course, like the nurses doing everything that they had to do in order to get those charts prepared for the physician so that way it can decrease those times for them. And also too, within the system, we were um, having our patients, um, we were including the questionnaires in Epic for them um, if they have the capability of uh, my chart. So my chart is the way that um, our patients can communicate with our providers and our nurses, and that's the quickest way that you'll be able to get to us versus phone. So once we have that my chart notification to them, um, we're just instantly, it'll pop up, you know, they'll have a question and we're in it and within the amount of like, um, we're trying to get to like 24 hours and I think we were at 100%. Oh, For the sake yeah. of time, so. we should probably move. <laughs> forward. So, and if there are any questions, we can answer them. Can you go to the next slide, please, Shay? Thank you, Jocelyn. Awesome. Oh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> so I just want to reflect back to Julia's slide number 11 and what you've heard from me and Jocelyn really shows how um, those 
five influencers of sustaining projects are so important. So relationships, um, in example number one, you we talked about how we focused on cross-part collaboration across all regions. In Jocelyn's example number two, uh, focusing on trusting and respecting the nursing staff to manage the health maintenance activities, and it worked, right? Senior management examples, both examples were strongly supported by senior management. Uh, my manager is, on, is the chair of the CQM committee. And Jocelyn, at the clinic Jocelyn works in, we talked about the Gemba walks, and I contacted her director to ask permission to, for Jocelyn to present with me today. And she said, sure, thank you. Thank you for giving us the chance to highlight our great work, which goes down to broadcasting successes, preparing for turnover. It did it. There's been a lot of turnover at the Fax Clinic. I know because a lot of those folks are my friends, but they still are doing the work. It isn't about the, I mean, it is about the people, great people, but the process to get the vaccines and all that stands alone, right? It doesn't matter who's working that day. Everyone knows what to do. So um, that's kind of what we wanted to share with you today, but we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. And I believe that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie and Jocelyn. That was awesome. Um, you know, we give round, in CQII, we give rounds of applause like this. So I just want to give you all a round of applause. You're doing such great work. And to highlight how like how sustainability looks like on the ground is just, that's awesome. Um, I want to open it up for questions to see if anybody has any particular questions um, as it relates just to the either didactic or for Julie or Jocelyn? Shay just put the uh, link to the toolkit with uh, Dr. Thomas's work there. Again, there's so many great resources. I, I recommend uh, heading out to that. Well, I have a, I have a question. It's, it's, both, it's both for Julie and Jocelyn. You know, um, sustainability planning, if you haven't done it before, can kind of feel overwhelming because it's like, I don't know, I want to sustain everything. All of it's great. Right. So what would be your your recommendations for like if I'm new to sustainability planning and I'm first starting out, like what's what are the important things to like really focus on? What did you do yourself to get it started? So for me, uh, like you presented in the slides, we had to make sure that it was feasible. Is, is this within our circle of influence as a nurse? Is the medical director going to agree to this idea? Is it valuable to the clients? And can we afford it? What is, does it cost more money? Not really, no, because we were supposed to be given those vaccines all along and patients deserved it. So we, we knew that we needed to do this. So for the vaccine project, for the at the state level, I know that everyone, there's a lot of turnover like we talked about. So there's always a need for capacity building. We need infrastructure or else we can't do our work, especially in such a huge state. And clients move a lot. So having a statewide data system where, you know, if someone moves to another town in Texas, at least, you know, once they give a consent, they can have access to the data system and see what's already happened, what, you know, they may need or not need, things like that. Jocelyn, do you have anything to add? Um, basically, everything that you said, um, Julia, like we, we have the, um, of course, our clinical uh, quality uh, meetings here with our uh, director and the um, physicians of the clinic every uh, quarter. Um, actually, our, our next one is next week. So we all get together and just kind of go over things in general, of like what What's happening in the clinic? What are we, um, as far as lacking on? Is there anything that we knew, need to do as far as improvement wise? So that's how we, you know, kind of keep things, um, you know, sustained because, you know, we have to um, just kind of get together as a, as a whole and just, you know, come up with ideas that um, may be, you know, more valuable for our, our clients here in the clinic. So. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to try an exercise with everybody in the call here that um, is from a colleague, Lori DiLorenzo. It's called a chatterfall. 
And essentially what you'll do is you will type your aha moment into the chat box, but don't hit enter yet. Like don't send it yet. I'm going to give everybody like one minute to think of their, the thing in this presentation that you're like, I am going to walk away from that. I'm going to bring it back to my folks and just wait a minute. And then after one minute, we're all going to hit enter and we're going to see this beautiful line of aha moments together. So let's try that. If you're ready, you can use your uh, reaction button and give me a thumbs up. Or if you're on screen, you give me a visual thumbs up. Thank you, Raquelian. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jen. Carol. Carol's from San Antonio too. Marie, perfect. Shay, Mara. All right, let's do it, folks. On the count of three. One, two, three, Chatterfall. Woo, this is fun. I love it when it happens like this. This is so cool. All right, so let's look at some of these guys. 12 sustainability factors, pick three to four, the value of leadership, respect and trust in the staff to sustain improvements, awesome. The menu of factors, customizable, I love it. Displaying and sharing QI data. Oh, this is great, Carol, I love yours. Although you may not reach a goal the right, right away, there's always room for improvement and ways to continue building on the process you have created. Perceived values, awesome. Hearing examples from other agencies, there's a toolkit that can help with sustainability. Yes, there is. This is awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, I really want to give a special shout out to Julie and Jocelyn because um, your work on the ground is what helps us understand and apply these concepts so that it's just so nice to have you all with us. And I hope everybody enjoys the nice long weekend coming up. Relax. Thank you, Shay. I forgot to say this. We do have a poll. We always want to know. <laughs> practice our own, you know, what we talk about. We want process improvement for our own TA webinars. So please be honest, fill this out. And um, thank you again for being with us. Have a great one.